Good morning and welcome. That was One Bread, One Body from our United Methodist Hymnal. And that is a hymn that reminds us, using the sacrament of communion, that we are one body. And the act of communion is one of the most powerful symbols that we can all share that binds us together. My name is Zach Rowling. I am the Worship Arts Director at Indianola First United Methodist Church, and I am here with pastors Tim Bonney and Brian Williams, and we have taken worship into the world, on the road, and we are here at the United Methodist Conference Center up here on the south side of Des Moines. And uh, pastors Tim and Brian will talk more about that, but I want to welcome you here this morning. Well, good morning, and welcome to First United Methodist Church's worship. As Zach mentioned, we are on the road. We are at the Iowa Annual Conference Center, as he mentioned. It's on the south side of Des Moines, near the airport. So if you hear a plane going by, that's what you're hearing. It's not uh, Pastor Tim snoring. Uh, it's, it's a joy to have you in worship this morning. Uh, a couple things we want you to be aware of before we get started. Um, as we have sung a communion hymn already, we want to let you know that Wednesday the 12th at 6.30 p.m., 
Uh, Pastor Tim is going to be offering communion through, on Facebook Live, which you can also find on our uh, website uh, as our Facebook videos are linked there. So that's Wednesday the 12th at 6.30. Um, another thing, this Wednesday the 5th, from 9 to 11 in Buxton Park, Pastor Tim is going to be um, having, uh, you might call them office hours, if you will, in the park. Um, so if you want to come by with your own chair and your own beverage for a social distance time to talk with Pastor Tim about whatever's on your heart and mind, um, he's going to be there from 9 to 11, um, willing and able to visit with you. Um, and we also want to let you know that information is coming out very soon, perhaps even today, about those prayer appointments that we talked about, where you can come to our sanctuary in uh, Indianola and uh, pray and be in a reflective space and, and maybe get in there and just experience again what it's like to be in our beautiful sanctuary. So information is coming out about that and how you can sign up for that very, very soon. And so we would invite you into that time. At this time, I would invite you to join with me in our opening prayer. Dear Lord, as the people of Indianola First UMC, we are part of the larger body of Christ in the connection of the United Methodist Church. We are thankful for the relationships we have in the UMC and through the Iowa Annual Conference. Bless us as we use our connections to better serve you, our community, and the world. Help us to remember that we do so much more together than we could ever do alone. Bless first UMC and the UMC as we follow you. In Christ's name, amen. Our opening song is They'll Know We Are Christians By Our Love. Uh, here on the south side of Des Moines. 
Uh, we are beginning a sermon series, a worship series this month on our United Methodist Connections. And uh, in fact, when you see um, the title of my sermon show up, it'll actually be spelled Connection, C-O-N-N-E-X-I-O-N, which is a Methodist slash British way of spelling connection uh, that reminds us of what it means to be connected. Let me read a passage of scripture for you, and we're going to talk more about what does it mean to be connected in Christ? What does it mean to be connected in the United Methodist Church? And, and what is the value and the excitement that comes from those kind of connections? So I'm reading from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. Certainly, the body isn't one part, but many. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the whole body were an ear, or if the whole body were an eye, what would happen to the hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, what would happen to the sense of smell? But as it is, God has placed each one of the parts of the body just like he wanted. If all were one and the same body part, what would happen to the body? But as it is, there are many parts, but one body. So the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Or in turn, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Instead, the parts of the body that people think are the weakest are the most necessary. The parts of the body that we think are less honorable are the ones we honor the most. The private parts of the body that aren't presentable are the ones that are given the most dignity. The parts of our body that are presentable don't need this, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the part with less honor, so that there won't be division in the body, and so the parts might have mutual concern for each other. If one part of the body suffers, all parts suffer with it. If one part gets the glory, all the parts celebrate with it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as we share in this uh, worship series, uh, in which we share in our United Methodist Connections, uh, I'm going to let you be a little bit surprised, and uh, as we do this each week, you'll find out where our next uh, fun and exciting location is. We decided to start with the annual conference center, uh, not because the building is the church, but because this chapel and, and all of the people who serve in this building, uh, the staff of the Iowa Annual Conference, our bishop and the bishop's uh, staff, uh, are representations of our connectedness as United Methodists. You might notice that we are part of the United Methodist Church. Not the United Methodist Churches, but the United Methodist Church. We are, as United Methodist, a connectional body. So if you are a professing member or a baptized member of First United Methodist Church of Indianola, you are also simultaneously a member of the entire body of Christ in the United Methodist Church. You uh, have the, the benefits and the responsibilities of being part of that body. And the fact that we are part of this large body gives us great opportunities for ministry, for service, for learning, for sharing, for working and ministering together. Pastor Brian and I were talking before the service started, uh, trying to remind ourselves of, of how many uh, individual local churches there are in our conference. And, and, and I believe there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 local churches in the Iowa Conference of the United Methodist Church, and somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 active pastors in this conference. There are a lot of United Methodists in Iowa who, who worship on Sunday and other days of the week, who are worshiping in dozens and hundreds maybe of places online uh, this morning, uh, who are ministering in their individual communities in, in ways that are, that are unique. 
some of which are doing traditional worship and blended worship and contemporary worship and maybe jazz worship and, and maybe uh, worship in other languages, we're sure, and other, other ways of being church. That we have this wide and broad family that we're a part of. Now, the benefit for us in that is we have opportunities to learn from each other, to serve together, to minister together in ways that we could not as one single congregation alone. We have opportunities to contribute uh, through our gifts and through our apportionment to the United Methodist Church and therefore support ministries and missions in the United States and around the world that as an individual congregation we could never afford to fund. And yet as the body of Christ through the United Methodist Church, we support diverse ministries. We support organizations like UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, that is one of the premier relief organizations in the world. UMCOR is known as one of the organizations that when there's a disaster, they're one of the first groups to arrive and one of the last to leave because United Methodists see the importance of being there for people in time of suffering and disaster. We benefit because we get to know people in other ways and when we gather together we learn from each other we learn from people's cultures and experiences ways of worshiping ways of being and we also have opportunities to contribute because we're part of a body we're part of a large body we can do we can do so much together there's also something special in knowing that wherever you go around the country, around the world, in fact, Michelle and I enjoy this when we go on vacation and we drive down the road and we, we like to catch a glimpse of, of the United Methodist logo uh, or a name of a church or a street sign. And occasionally I'll get off of the road and drive a few blocks over because I want to see what their United Methodist Church looks like and, and maybe get a glimpse of, of maybe a, a piece of what their ministry in the neighborhood they might be ministering to. We're part of that kind of, of broad fellowship. Connection also means that locally and all around us, as individual Christians, we're not alone. There's a real danger I think particularly emphasized in our Western American culture of individualizing the faith too much. Of thinking that the church is there for me and I need to find the church that meets my needs and I need to find the church that feeds me. Sometimes when someone comes to me and says, Pastor, I'm hunting for a church that will feed me, I get the picture in my mind of little baby birds in, in a nest with their mouths all wide open, stuck out, waiting for mama to come along and stuff something in their mouths. But there comes a point in which, of course, as, the, as those birds get older, as they grow, that mom shoves them out of the nest and they're expected to find their own food. And so while we do need to be fed, one of the things we try to learn in our faith is that we feed each other. And so, as, as Zach's saying, one bread, one body, that's just a beautiful symbol of, of what it is we share at the Lord's table in communion, what it is we share in the church, that we are a group that's connected in this one body, and we really don't have all of the faith to ourselves, and we can't really be the church all by ourselves. Now, we really know this instinctively if we think about uh, the words of Paul and what he says and the obvious things he says about the body. And you know, if, if you've ever had anything particularly wrong with some part of your body, it's amazing how it affects everything else you do. Um, it's been a number of years ago, uh, but when I was in Sioux City, I managed to, to do something. I was helping uh, my wife move a couch and we had lifted the couch and I turned the wrong way and I felt something give in my back. Turned out later I real discovered from the doctor I went to that I had pulled uh, or injured a muscle. And it took several weeks and even ended up going to some physical therapy to get over this. And I never had real back trouble before. Some of you who suffer from that 
you have my prayers and sympathy because I've only experienced it a little bit. And I realized that there was very little I could do that I didn't have that pain there affecting what I was doing. Standing, sitting, walking, lying down. That one muscle not being right affected everything I was trying to do. Even when I was in church, I'd start to get in and out of a chair and you'd just see me slowly sit down and slowly rise and try to preach. And so we need each other. And when any one of us is hurting or, or at a loss or, or experiencing difficulties, it really is important for all of us to support that individual and those people. In this time of, of pandemic and and separation physically, one of the things the church is trying to do is find new ways to share our connections together. Some of that is through video like today, uh, worshiping in video, video check-ins. Some of it is finding creative ways of being together. Uh, more and more, I think, in the coming weeks, our individual life groups, our, our, our staff, our social groups are going to be finding ways to meet outside and socially distanced and taking care. Um, we will probably find additional ways to use online things like Zoom and, and others to gather when we can't do the physical uh, gathering. We look at new ways to, to connect to people through, through phone and through letters and, and, and some of it in a way is almost moving back to the future because we're having to use older means uh, of getting a hold of people and talking to people that maybe we had neglected. But being part of a connection is of such a great value. Such a great value. I grew up in a different faith tradition, and so one of the things I really appre appreciate about the United Methodist system is how our churches even work together in making sure that each congregation has a pastor. Our appointment system through our bishop and our cabinet who meet in this building helps us to make sure that all our congregations from the largest to the smallest have pastoral leadership and, and can count on that leadership being there. Methodists are used to one pastor moving out and the next pastor being there in three or four days. There are people in many denominations who would be amazed that that could happen that they look for months and months sometimes to find pastoral leadership. But our connectedness gives us opportunities to disperse our leadership for the needs of the church and to match the gifts and graces of pastoral leadership with the needs of a congregation. Is the system perfect? Of course not. But it is a well-thought-out, coordinated system that helps us be the church. The other thing that I always get from this passage of scripture that I wanted to share with you is that it's often people you don't see. Often people you don't see that are keeping our connection going. Sometime when you get a chance, pull up the, the conference website, iaumc.org, and take a look at the staff people who work here in the conference center, uh, the faces of our district superintendents, our bishop, and recognize that they are working behind the scenes often to, to uh, support what we're doing in Indianola. Um, many of you have probably never been to this building, and some of those people you've never met, but they're providing literature and resources and webinars and training for your pastors and for your leaders. They're helping to strategize uh, for the future of our conference behind the scenes. Just like at church, often it's the people you don't see who do so much. One of the churches I was associate pastor at when I was in seminary, we had a gentleman whose first name was Harold. Um, he was uh, an older gentleman and, and had been involved in the church for many, many years. He was someone who honestly kept that church going in a lot of ways. If there was a light bulb out, You'd find him there on Monday morning replacing it. It was a small church. We didn't have a lot of custodial staff. If something broke, he was there suddenly fixing it. 
If someone had a need, he was there finding ways to provide it. If someone um, needed some food, you would find that he and his family would contribute towards that need. He never wanted any recognition. One year, the nominating committee decided that he would just be great to be on our, our congregational care uh, group uh, because he was so caring and so sharing with other people. And to our shock, he didn't want to be on the committee. But we said, Harold, you're doing everything that this committee wants to be doing. You're filling all of these roles. You're helping so many people. And he said, yeah, but I don't like to get up in front of people. I prefer not to be seen. And I don't want the credit. And so one of the greatest leaders of that church probably was one who was largely unknown to many people who walked in the building. Yet I shudder to think what the church would have done without him. I'm speaking probably to many of you like that in our own congregation, who through what you do behind the scenes on, in, in related to worship and hospitality, related to educating children and, and, and uh, uh, meeting the needs of others, helping out with open table or, or uh, new projects like the Heal House, your names aren't mentioned as often as they ought to be. Yet you are proving the value of the connectedness we have in Christ by what you do. You are making First United Methodist Church be the church it should be. One person at a time. Now you might be sitting out there thinking, well, I'd like to do something for the church, but I don't know what I could do. Please consider dropping an email or calling myself or Pastor Brian and tell us what you're interested in. Tell us what's meaningful to you. Tell us what excites you. And we can talk about how we can minister together in those ways. You know, I'm sure, but in case you don't, I'm going to say it. The staff of First United Methodist Church are not the church. Oh, we're part of it. But we're not the church. You are. You are. And you are what makes First United Methodist Church a wonderful, caring, loving place simply for who you are and how you connect with each other. Last week, I think it was, Brian said he was giving you some homework. I'm going to give you some homework this week, too. While you're enjoying sitting at home worshiping, maybe you're sitting on your couch with a nice cup of coffee, and maybe you're eating your breakfast as we're talking, or maybe you decided to watch the service later because you're not a morning person, think about the people who, if you were in an in-person worship service that you normally sit with, the people that are on your left and right, the people that maybe are on the pews behind you or in front of you. Now, I imagine, if you are like me, that you miss those people. I would encourage you this week to take a moment and drop at least one of those people a card or an email or make a phone call and say, hey, I sure miss sitting in church with you. How are you doing? How are you doing? How are things going for you right now? Have some conversation. Share and exchange some notes. Because among all those people who we usually see sitting in our congregation, I'm sure there are a number who would so appreciate even the smallest opportunity for encouragement. Because we're the body of Christ. We need each other. We are together. We are connected in Christ. And it is our connections that make us strong. Let's pray together. 
Lord, I am very thankful for the people called the United Methodist Church. And today I want to lift up our United Methodist connection. All the pastors and churches and lay leaders and lay people that make up this conference and the United Methodist family. I want to lift up our bishop, Lori Howell, who works so hard to be a leader and, and to help us find right directions in difficult times. I'm so thankful for her, Lord. And I want to lift up our district superintendent, He Shun Jun who in this coming year is going to be Dean of the Cabinet. I lift up Hishan because I'm so thankful for his love and his wisdom and his graciousness and for being my pastor. Be with the leaders of our conference. Be with all those who are serving in all the many churches in this community. Help us to be salt and light in a world that is hurting. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity again to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, if we were in in-person worship, uh, now would be about the time I would normally call for the ushers to come forward and bring forward offering plates. Maybe a long time before we do it quite that way. In fact, when we get together in person again, it's more likely that we'll have offering baskets in the, in the foyer for you, uh, the narthex, for you to drop in offering. But remember that the offering is an opportunity for you to say thanks to God for the work of the church. It's an opportunity for you to commit a part of your resources to the ministry of First United Methodist Church and the entire body of God's people called the United Methodist Church. We thank you for your support during these difficult times. And for those of you who are not able to do what you usually do, maybe because this has affected your work, we know you're doing what you can. And for those who are able in this time to do more, we're also so thankful for that. We all give as God leads us to give. And may we always do that as an act of worship together. God bless you all. Well, thank you, Tim, for those beautiful words. Um, and as we are here and as we're preaching on connection, it's been a reminder to me of how important connection is. And, and even as we have been together in this way for several months now, how vital that is to our, to our faith. And so, sort of in that vein, I want to offer the centerpiece for our prayer time today. As, um, as we pray together, I'm going to be leading us in the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer, which is a prayer that goes back to John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. And so I'm going to offer that as we think about what it means to covenant with God um, as fellow co-laborers in the work of Christ. Um, I'll, I'll start with some silence, lead us in that, and close in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. We pray, O oh God, these words offered by John Wesley, praying, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or set aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all these things to your pleasure and disposal. 
And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. In praying for that covenant, O God, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our closing song. All the people said amen. Gracious God, you are so good to us because you're with us. You're with us wherever we are. And wherever we are, we can worship you. We can pray. We can, we can joyfully thank you for your love and grace. As we leave this place of worship, we pray that you would guide us as a church guide the United Methodist Church, that we would grow and grow and grow in the grace of God to reach out and embrace all the world. For our founder, John Wesley, said, the world is my parish. May it be so. Amen.